If you're watching this on YouTube, you might have noticed that this episode is a week delayed. But if you want to get early access to our episodes, consider becoming a paying member. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share it with your friends. Thank you for all your support. Richard Dawkins is a familiar name in science. In a string of best-selling books, The Selfish Gene, The Blind Watchmaker, and recently, Climbing Mountain Probable, he has changed the way we think about evolution. This year, he became Oxford's first professor in the public understanding of science. And now, he wants to change the way we think about science. This is a very heavy ball. It's heavier than a real cannonball because it's made of solid lead. It's 10 times as heavy as a human head. Now, what I want you to do, stand back against this post, hold it against your nose, let go, and then stand in the same place. And because of Newton's laws and the law of conservation of energy, you can guarantee that that ball will stop short of your nose and not hurt you. Now, are there any volunteers to do the experiment? Okay, I'll have to do it myself. The problem is that science is not a natural part of our lives. We should all know that there's no danger in that experiment. We should know the science that tells us so. But obviously not all of us do. So my purpose in this program is to show why science should become an integral part of all our lives. I hope to show you the dangers we face when we turn our back on science and embrace anti-science. <laughs> and the risks we run if we don't understand what science can do. But of course, the message isn't all gloom and doom, far from it. Science can offer the highest form of joy. You'll meet three colleagues of mine who had that once-in-a-lifetime chance all scientists long for, of shouting Eureka. A good place for me to start is with the beginning of everything. There is still a lot we don't know about the origins of the universe, and we must keep investigating but a broad picture of the evolution of life has emerged which is no longer open to reasonable doubt. The world is about four and a half billion years old. Pretty soon, well, within the first billion years or so, the first living cell arose. And from that, we are all descended, all plants, all animals, all humans. That's an established fact. We're all cousins. Scientists accept it just as they accept that the world is round and not flat, and it orbits the sun and not the other way around. Not to believe it would be absurd. And yet... A few months ago, I went on a lecture tour of the United States. My subject was evolution. One stop was at Auburn, Alabama, in the deep south of the country. I was outraged to find how many people there still believed in something science tells us is ridiculous. Well, I'm a Christian, so I believe in God and Jesus and that he created the Earth. I believe you can see evolution in the world today, in nature today, in terms of how different species adapted to their environment. But as far as that being a means of how like one cell became a man, I don't believe that happened. God created man in his own image from um, that he created Adam from the dirt and um, I believe that it happened just as the Bible says it. 
Before I reinforce too many prejudices about the Deep South Bible Belt, I should point out that beliefs on this issue are remarkably constant across the United States. For instance, anywhere you go, more than half the people you meet will believe Adam and Eve actually existed. Why have no new major groups of living things appeared in the fossil record for a long time? What's different here, though, is that this nonsense is official. Last November, the Alabama Board of Education decided that every biology textbook should carry a sticker, the Alabama insert, challenging the theory of evolution. The move was supported by state governor Fob James. Then a thousand years later, come up to here. <laughs> His pantomiming of evolution is now a local legend. If one wanted to understand something about the origin of human life that uh, you might ought to look at Genesis and you can get the whole story, period. Here are just a couple of extracts from the insert that Governor James inspired. The first sentence refers to evolution as a controversial theory some scientists present as a scientific explanation for the origin of living things. And tells us any statement about life's origins should be considered theory, not fact. Well, as you might expect, I couldn't let this pass unchallenged. Thank you very much indeed. And what I thought I would do, uh, with your permission, is to depart from... So in my lecture to the beleaguered university at Auburn, I threw away my prepared speech and set about the Alabama insert, line by line. <laughs> this textbook discusses evolution, a controversial theory some scientists present as a scientific explanation for the origin of living things, such as plants, animals, and humans. This is sneaky and dishonest. Some scientists, controversial, suggest the existence of a substantial number of respectable scientists who do not accept evolution. In fact, the proportion of qualified scientists who do not accept evolution is tiny. And that holds for this one. For it may have been fun for me to get laughs from an enlightened audience, but for Alabama's biology teachers, this insert is no laughing matter. Gene is a sequence of nucleotides in a molecule of... Dr. John Franson is head of biology at nearby Tuskegee University. Organisms, like most organisms... More than half his students don't believe in evolution. ...are made of DNA and protein. And now he has the insert to contend with as well. For many of these people, when it comes to teaching evolution, the well has been poisoned. Now these are going to be their last, in many cases, their last science courses. And then these kids are going to go on, and they're going to become the politicians. They're going to become the leaders of industry. They're going to be the movers and shakers in society. I don't believe that uh, man come from apes, that or he could have evolved from an ape. I just don't believe that. I like the idea much better that I came from Adam and Eve versus coming from an ape. So. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the bottom line. I agree. <laughs> In the vast digital wilderness, there is a guardian that can keep your online journey secure and affordable. It is called Atlas VPN, and here is why you need it in your digital toolkit. So first, Atlas VPN is a lot more than just your ordinary VPN. It's your shield. It stops ads, malware, malicious links, and trackers. So think of it as the immune system for all of your online adventures, keeping you safe from data theft. Now, for my fellow thinkers and seekers of knowledge, Atlas VPN has another trick up its sleeve. It also helps you save money while shopping online. So whether it's Netflix, Spotify, your next flight or hotel booking, Atlas VPN helps you uncover all of the best deals. But the icing on the cake is that with just one subscription, Atlas VPN can protect all of your devices unlimited protection. So this is like having an army of digital bodyguards for your smartphone, your tablet, laptop, whatever else you can conceive of, which is awesome. And the best part is that Atlas VPN offers an incredible deal of just $1.83 per month, plus an extra three months and a 30 day money back guarantee. This is the steal for the kind of protection it provides, not just for your security, but for your privacy as well. 
and all of this for less than the price of a cup of coffee. Don't wait. Click the link in the video description below to take advantage of this limited time offer and secure your digital journey. But don't let's get too smug about the foibles of our American cousins. We're not so smart ourselves when it comes to knowing the scientific basics. Professor John Durant at Imperial College in London has made a study of British attitudes to science, and his last big survey revealed some big gaps. Only about a third of our sample knew that antibiotics, one of the most important classes of drugs, don't kill viruses, they only kill uh, bacteria. Uh, only about a third knew the Earth goes round the sun once a year. Uh, and less than half, actually, uh, in 1988, were able to say that DNA uh, is a substance that has to do with living things. And those, I think, are quite surprising and perhaps quite eye-opening to scientists. I find this lack of scientific understanding worrying. And what's worse, as a society, we seem happy to tolerate such ignorance. I've noticed a double standard in our society with respect to science. Earlier this year, I was on a late night television talk show and I mentioned the names of Watson and Crick. And the chairman promptly stopped me and said, for the benefit of viewers, who are Watson and Crick? Now, if I'd said I'd just be into the Cezanne exhibition, she wouldn't have dreamed of saying, for the benefit of viewers, who was Cezanne. And that double standard matters. Not that we should value Cezanne less, but we should seek to value science more. No one knows that better than that great messenger of science, Sir David Attenborough. Now I'm getting up into the canopy, into the world of the birds of paradise. He feels strongly that a practical knowledge of science and its uses would benefit everybody. And here's the top. The birds are in another emergent tree, just like this one, and I've got I've got an absolutely clear view of them. I am quite sure that people will get a greater pleasure, not only from knowing how things work, but from being able to take competent decisions about their own life. Uh, I mean, you ought to be able to know how to repair a fuse. Um, you ought to be able to know roughly what goes wrong with your car when something goes wrong with it. I confess I'm not very good at that myself. But, but you ought to have some idea as to, as to the way these things work. And, and that is science. The point is that this kind of ignorance means we don't understand what science can tell us and what it cannot. And that is serious because science is used by journalists and especially politicians to persuade us that they are right. The issue is no longer a question of the safety of British beef. The best available evidence demonstrates that British beef and beef products can be safely eaten by consumers both here and around the world. Do you believe him? You need to know a bit about science to be able to answer that. I don't mean the latest facts about BSE research, but at least enough about scientific method to know that you cannot claim certainty from science. Science can never say the evidence demonstrates, for instance, that beef is definitely safe to eat. It can only offer probabilities and explain where current evidence points. It's then up to us as individuals to decide what to do with that information. What's very important, I think, is that these decisions aren't left to scientists or politicians or committees of scientists and politicians and bishops. Um, those aren't the people that should be making these decisions. Society as a whole should be. And I don't think society can make those decisions in a sensible way unless they have a basic understanding about the principles of science. As a scientist, I can't help feeling we seem to have lost our reason and gone mad. Not only are we turning our backs on science, we're embracing the world of anti-science. Everywhere you turn now, there are psychics, astrologers and paranormalists offering tin pot comforts for those who need reassurance. The paranormal is taking over newspapers, TV schedules and now apparently the high streets. You might think it's all a bit of a giggle. Well, I don't. It not only pervades a view of the world which is false, but it's also impoverished, poverty-stricken. 
People who believe in it, and I've seen some of them in that shop, credulous, gullible people, are missing so much. I think the paranormal needs to be debunked, and I know just the man to do it. Give a big hand. Ian Rowland is a psychic illusionist. He entertains audiences like this one at a London Students' Union, with phenomena of the kind regularly passed off as paranormal on TV shows. Flight of hand or any trickery whatsoever. Watch. Just, just look at this. Say bend in your mind. Keep helping it to go all the way. He trained as a conjurer and won't tell exactly how he does his tricks. Degrees, yeah? You see this clearly? <laughs> OK, and we want it to do But he's absolutely clear about one thing. I don't have any psychic or paranormal abilities whatsoever. Uh, I always state this quite clearly at the beginning of a show. Now and again, somebody wants to uh, argue the point and make out that I really am psychic, but I'm pretending not to be. But the honest truth is I'm as psychic as a teapot. <laughs> What I, I try and do is say that I can reproduce in my shows any kind of psychic or paranormal effect whatsoever. From mediumship, spoon bending, fire walking, ESP, clairvoyance, predictions, whatever. So far, anything that I've seen a, a so-called genuine psychic do, I've been able to do just as well, I think, in the shows that I do. like this, in which the blindfolded Ian has to find a member of the audience and stab a knife through the sign he's holding. For directions, he pretends to read this student's mind. No, if I get a reaction like that, I can hear and it's a giveaway. Please try your best not to flinch or move. Tracy, if you would just carry on, forward, left, back, whatever. Ah. Mm. Can you, can you, just yes or no, can you see where the knife is? Yes. It's now the knife you must guide, not me. I'm absolutely and utterly positive there is no such thing as anyone with psychic abilities. You have to understand that this sort of thing has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, and we still haven't found anyone who can demonstrate their so-called psychic powers under common sense, scientifically controlled conditions. They can do it in a TV studio, in their homes, on a stage. That's easy. I can do that. But nobody ever has come forward who can demonstrate these so-called abilities under conditions where you preclude the chance for trickery. Some people think that clairvoyance, horoscopes and the psychic charlatans you see on television are harmless because they're just entertainment. The danger is that people will come to take this sort of hocus-pocus seriously, will actually believe in it, and then the danger is that it will undermine or weaken their grasp on reality. I wonder what the reality was for most of the people at this paranormal gathering. They come to be cured by a Brazilian psychic surgeon. He claims to be a medium using the powers of helpers from the spirit world. The psychologist Richard Wiseman went along uninvited and was shocked by what he saw. We went along to look at some psychic surgeons that were operating in the middle of London. Now what these people were claiming was that no matter what the illness was, they could make various incisions into the body, release the bad spirits and the person would get well. <laughs> we saw 16 people, one after the other, come into the operating room, lay down. He would, uh, they'd have their, their stomachs cut into, not deep cuts, but real cuts with uh, blood obviously over the surgeon's hands and instruments. Uh, then there'd just be some cotton wool placed over the cut and they'd be sent on their way. <laughs> 
Now, there was absolutely no medical procedures there in terms of us sort of sterilizing the instruments or even washing the hands in between patients. Most of the people were there because they had some kind of serious illness. In fact, a reporter who uh, um, carried out the investigation with us later found out that two of the people were HIV positive. Now, there is enormous risk, obviously, with um, you know, cutting into those types of people and then using the same instruments on other patients. The bottom is you must believe in God. I was horrified that this was going on in central London in 1995. Um, it seems to me it's an absolutely bizarre and ridiculous ritual that people are opening themselves out to all sorts of illnesses by going there. They're very unlikely to get better. Um, so I think, you know, that's a very good example of exactly how dangerous a belief in the paranormal can be. Some patients claimed they'd been cured, but one woman called the police in hysterics and the psychic team were banned from the premises. I think it's tragic when people fall for the specious charms of the paranormal. We scientists are clearly failing people if they think they need answers in the psychic world. I believe that science is still the only way of finding answers to life's mysteries. That's why I write my books. The problem is the demand for 100% certainty. Take one of the most exciting discoveries of recent years, DNA fingerprinting, the achievement of Sir Alec Jeffries. Like so many scientific breakthroughs, it was at once both marvelous and misunderstood. DNA fingerprinting arose in this laboratory by complete accident. I mean, I had no views back in the early 80s or even thoughts about forensic DNA typing. I mean, it was you know, crazy science fiction. At the time, Professor Jeffries was trying to study variation in human DNA to provide better markers to help scientists study inherited illness and cancer. He developed a technique that used radioactivity to highlight variable regions in the DNA. He knew it would show different patterns for different people, but he was unprepared for just how different those patterns would be. I think it was one morning, Monday morning, in September 1984, and it was a moment of total eureka. I was in the dark room, I pulled this bit of x-ray film out of the, the uh, developing tank and I could see all these uh, radioactive bands on the x-ray film, you could see all this variation between people. Suddenly I realised that here was a technology where the application was completely different from what it had been developed for, which was medical genetics. At that point I started getting really excited. These patterns were so variable that it was obvious you could use it for identity testing. We had a family group on the film so we could see the family relationship testing. We had some non-human species on the film and the system worked with those so we could immediately see things like animal biology, dog paternity testing, which is carried out, believe it or not, conservation biology. So it was a wonderful moment where my, my life suddenly changed direction completely in the space of about five minutes. It was just, it was, you know, like, like a dog with far too many tails, you know, running around the laboratory and getting you know, very juvenile, very excited. It was, it was great fun. I have to say, the first DNA fingerprint was truly awful. I mean, you, you wouldn't hang a dog based on that evidence. But I'm, I'm an optimist in science, and I could see the potential. And indeed, within a few months, we'd refine the technology to produce yeah, really quite good and uh, reliable uh, DNA fingerprints. They were soon in use in the courts to establish identity. But the way they were used points up how easy it is to misunderstand science. Some lawyers leapt on the new technology as foolproof and accepted DNA evidence without question, a dangerous thing to do with any evidence, while others just plain mistrusted it and sought to undermine it. Untrained in science, the legal profession lurched from one extreme to the other. Lawyers are somehow under the impression that scientists can deliver absolute certainty and say, yes, we are 100% sure that, 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 for example, this biological evidence came from this defendant. I mean, that is naive. Science does not work like that. Science never, ever generates absolute proof. That should ring a bell. Scientific certainty is just what the politicians demanded in the mad cow crisis, and we've seen where that has led to. But does it matter if lawyers are naive about science? 
Well, I'm on my way to see a man who's got an answer to that question. Institutional ignorance of science turned his life upside down. When I realised what a life sentence meant was when I got to Wakefield, which was about a week and a half after conviction. And I was calling to the probation officers. Do you understand what a life sentence is? She says to me. I says, no. She said, well, you are now under the sentence of 99 years. And I shit myself. In 1990, Kevin Callan was a lorry driver and living with his girlfriend, Leslie, and her four-year-old daughter, Mandy, who had cerebral palsy. In November, Mandy became ill after a series of falls and died, apparently of a brain injury. In the midst of his grief, Kevin became caught up in a nightmare. He was accused of shaking Mandy to death. The knocks come on the door, and I, know, I now know him to be a DCI. He says, can I have a word with you in the kitchen? And I've gone in the kitchen with him and his partner, and he says, I'm arresting you on suspicion of murder. And by this time, I was stood with my back against the units in the kitchen. I literally slithered down them. I felt all the blood just go from me. The prosecution case rested on the diagnosis of Mandy's injuries. Brain injuries are the specialty of neuropathology. But the prosecution only called on a paediatrician and a pathologist to testify. Their evidence pointed the finger at Kevin. The defence chose to rebut this by relying on two similar experts. And I asked my junior barrister where my experts were when it came time for the defence. And he just turned around and told me to shut up. So then, the end of the... Your own barrister? Oh, yeah. Shut up. Yeah. The end of the prosecution case came. It was our turn, and they called me to the stand, which meant I was the only one from the defence to give evidence. No experts, nobody else but myself. Kevin's experts weren't called because their diagnosis agreed with the prosecution. He was convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment. Kevin set about proving that the law had got it wrong. He was not an educated man, but he began to teach himself neuropathology. He spent months making detailed notes from textbooks. Then he found a book called Head Injuries, The Facts, written by Philip Wrightson, a New Zealand neuropathologist. From that, when I read it, I read it again and again, upside down, back to front. Any which way you could have read that book, I read it, because in there was what happened to Mandy. Judges. Kevin sent Professor Wrightson the details of the case, including the autopsy notes. This good doctor wrote back at once, demolishing the prosecution's scientific evidence. It was quite heavy in, in a condemnation of the evidence. Unjustifiable was one word. Of course, this is not so. Impossible to justify was another one. And they go on and on and on. Wrightson confirmed Kevin's story. For him, the evidence showed that Mandy had died from the fall, not from being shaken. Kevin was released and has since married Mandy's mother, Leslie. But an innocent man spent four years in jail because all the lawyers involved in his case did not realize a brain injury needs a brain expert until a new team took up his appeal. Nobody, absolutely nobody, had understood the particular expertise that was required in this case. The original solicitor, the original barristers on both sides did not appreciate this. The judge at the trial did not appreciate it. They're the ones who, as a defendant, or should I say ex-defendant, who you place your whole, in, well, yeah, literally your whole life in. And if they don't know what they're talking about, your case cannot therefore be presented in the proper way. There must be a very substantial number of people sitting in prison now who are sitting there because forensic science has played a major contribution in their conviction. And 
Furthermore, that that forensic science may have been flawed. I suspect that if lawyers were more familiar with science, there'd be fewer miscarriages of justice. It's just another powerful argument for society to take science more seriously. There are so many reasons for making science a part of our lives, and I don't want to dwell on the negative ones. So let's get out of the courtroom and into something more rewarding. Join me after the break. This is the University Museum in Oxford. It's full of the most wonderful objects, skeletons, rocks and fossils, which tell us something about how we came to be. That's why I love this place. It's a spiritual home for me. If you let it, science offers the best answer to the deep questions of existence. Who am I? Where did I come from? What am I for? It'll illuminate the world you live in and show you where you stand in the universe. We haven't long between the beginning and the end of our personal existence. Science offers us the privilege, before we die, of understanding why we were ever born in the first place. I look for understanding to the study of evolution to Darwin's astonishingly powerful explanation for all of life. It satisfies my head and my heart. Others find their satisfaction in different areas, but wherever scientists are looking, they are all asking the same kind of question. I, as a boy, lived in Leicestershire. And in, um, if you go to part of that Leicestershire, you can go into a quarry and you can find a stone, and if you knock that stone open, you see a seashell in the middle of it. And if you're a boy of reasonable curiosity, you say, how is there a stone with a seashell in the middle of it, in the middle of a rock? And you want to know why. Um, and that's how I became interested in natural sciences. Now, I may do a program about birds of paradise, uh, in which you are, your mind is blown because birds of paradise do such extraordinary wonderful, amazing, beautiful, astonishing, unpredictable things. It becomes science if you then say, why do they do those things? Why do they do them as a family only in New Guinea? Why is a family only in New Guinea? And why is it that birds of paradise have males, only one out of a population will fertilize all the other females, and what are the consequences of that on the evolution of species? Then it becomes science. It is a question which anybody who is, starts off with that excitement about birds of paradise wants to know the answer, just as I did when I opened a rock and said, why is there a shell there? When we contemplate the color, variety, and complexity of the living world, it's easy to understand the satisfaction a scientist gets from studying it. Equally, when we regard space in its lonely majesty, we can appreciate why astronomers devote a lifetime to exploring the stars and where they came from. Astronomy certainly has me hooked. Uh, talking about the immensities of the universe, not just the distances, but the number of stars that there are, stars like our sun, the possibility that there are other stars like our sun with planets, some of which might be inhabitable, some of which might be inhabited. So the idea that maybe we're not alone in the universe. The concept that our sun will not be around forever, that uh, one day it will begin to die and the earth will become uninhabitable. So we are transient people here. We are not here permanently. We cannot be here permanently. We will have to climb into spaceships and go explore the universe and find another place to live. Science doesn't have to be big to be beautiful or even beautiful to be rewarding. 
These tiny, apparently unprepossessing insects are a case in point. They're fruit flies, and they're full of secrets. Matthew Freeman has been studying fruit flies day in and day out since he graduated 10 years ago. He'd be the first to admit it can be a slog. A lot of science is day-to-day -day grind and not at all exciting. And sometimes when you get up on a Monday morning, you think, oh, God, I don't want to go into the lab again. But occasionally you get a little spark of insight into something which you know that no one has done before. Um, you understand some process, however small it is, in a way that you've been trying to battle to understand for a while and in a way that no one has done before. And I think that is really the key to the excitement. But in Dr. Freeman's case, the spark of insight was not so little. He's discovered something in fruit flies that may lead to a treatment for human cancer. And that started with finding a fly on my microscope that didn't have a normal eye. Instead of having a very smooth, regular pattern of the facets of the compound eye, it was very disrupted and rough, we called it. Um, and so immediately I was interested to try and understand why this fly's eye hadn't developed normally. So Dr. Freeman launched himself on the task of solving the problem. First, he had to breed a strain of fruit flies which had disrupted eyes. The next challenge was to find out which genes were causing the mutation. Then, when he and his team knew roughly what they were looking for, they analyzed the actual genetic code in a process rather like genetic fingerprinting. Three years later, they found the answer. The development of eye cells was controlled by a type of protein called a receptor. If this was overactive, it produced too many eye cells, giving the disrupted eye Dr. Freeman had seen under the microscope. It was a very exciting moment because, as I say, for two or three years, I had built up this idea that that might be what was going on. And so when, at the moment when I really started to allow myself to believe it was, therefore, tremendously exciting. Of course, the health of his fruit flies wasn't what was exciting Dr. Freeman. He takes the view that one cell works pretty much the same way as another in fruit flies, chimpanzees or humans. And indeed, the fruit fly receptor is present in all kinds of human cells too. Eureka! When that receptor is overactive in humans, that causes cancer. So having started with nothing but looking under my microscope at a fruit fly with a, with a disrupted eye, which doesn't have its normal, nice, smooth eye pattern, I've come up with this protein that may, in the future, be important um, in understanding and treating human cancer. Most of us couldn't do this. Probably wouldn't want to spend hours and hours in the lab with a lot of flies. But you don't need to be a scientist in order to appreciate science any more than you need to be a novelist in order to appreciate novels. I write the books that I do because I want to share my love of the natural world. As Carl Sagan said, not explaining science seems to me perverse. When you're in love, you want to tell the world. And many scientists like me have tried to tell the world, though even their best-selling science books don't grab the headlines like novels. This collection belongs to my friend Douglas Adams, creator of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Douglas was an English graduate, but these days it's not great novels he turns to first. I think I read much more science uh, than novels. I think the, you know, the role of the, the novel has changed a little bit. You know, in the 19th century, the novel was where you went to to get your sort of serious uh, reflections and questionings about about life. You get Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Uh, nowadays, of course, uh, you know the, the scientists actually tell us much, much more about uh, such issues um, than you'd ever get from novelists. So I think uh, you know, I, I uh, for the, for the the real sort of solid red meat of what I read, I'll go to go to science books and uh, you know read some sort of novels as light relief. So let me ask you, what is it about science that really gets your blood running? The world is is a thing of 
of utter, inordinate complexity and richness and strangeness um, that is absolutely awesome. I mean, the idea that such complexity can arise not only out of such simplicity, but probably absolutely out of nothing, is the most fabulous, extraordinary idea. And once you get some kind of inkling of how that might have happened, it's, it, it, it's, it's just... It's just wonderful. Um, and I feel that, uh, you know, the opportunity to spend um, 70 or 80 years of your life uh, in such a universe is time well spent, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> I quite agree, which brings me back to my passion, evolution. I never stop being amazed by the immense age of our world and what it means. I've tried to pass this on to others. Today, I'm visiting pupils at an Oxford school. I hope they, and you, share my enthusiasm. Right, does everybody know what evolution is, very roughly? Have you ever heard of it? Yeah. yeah? It's, it's why we're all here. It's where we come from. Because way, 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 way back, we all started as bacteria. And then as the generations went by, we got bigger and bigger and cleverer and cleverer. And we went through all sorts of stages gradually until now we're like we are now. So first we want somebody to be themselves today. Who would like to be themselves today? Okay, would you like to stand here? Now I'm going to make one meter equal one millennium. So one millennium back, that's one meter. Do you know who we get back to? They're about William the Conqueror. So would, would you like to be William the Conqueror? Okay. Okay, now, who wants to be Jesus Christ? I think, let's have a girl for Jesus Christ, shall we? What about you? So you stand another millennium back. And so on, until all 5,000 years of recorded history, back to the earliest Babylonian civilization, were represented by six children a meter apart. But we needed to go back further into evolutionary history. First stop, Homo habilis, two million years ago. Now, Where's he got, got to stand? This, 2,000 metres away. That'll take you sort of roughly at the top of Headington Hill. OK, off you go. <laughs> <laughs> Ramapathicus lived 14 million years ago. And as we delved further and further back in time, so our scale became more and more ludicrous, and the children were having to disappear to the four corners of the country. Oligochyphus, Ipswich. To save on the rail fares, I tried another tack to get the message across. So what I want you to do is to hold out your one hand, it doesn't matter which, let's say your right hand, all right? And the distance from your middle to the tip of your finger represents all the time since life began. That's 4,000 million years. Can anybody guess roughly where, say, the dinosaurs were on this scale? Yes. Yeah, that's not bad. It's surprisingly recent. And all of historical time, that's Jesus and King David and the pyramids and ancient Babylon, the ancient Egyptians, all that time, everything you've ever learned about in history, where do you think that would come? This far away from your tip of your finger no, or something like that. It's much, no, no, it's much further than that. Why do you think I handed out those nail files? If you get your nail file and get your middle finger and just do one stroke of the nail file and look at the dust that falls from your nail, and you might see a few grains of dust that fall from the tip of your nail. And the whole of human history has fallen in the dust from one stroke of the nail file. I thought it was really interesting. Um, it's sort of not really like some talks I've been to, which is just really boring. It was really fun, but it gave us a lot of information as well. I didn't actually realise that my relatives were bacteria. If you just take a nail file and do that, and that's how long the, the human race has been alive, I was really surprised about that. I thought the human race had been alive for since the beginning of... Things have been alive. Like most scientists, I'm a realist, but I'm also a bit of a romantic. 
It's something I share with my wife, Lala Ward, who now illustrates my books. I appreciate that there are people who think they need something more than science can offer, something frankly undefinable. But I think science does offer all we need, not just to understand the how of life with its great richness and complexity. For me, science goes as far as we meaningfully can go towards answering the why as well. If you enjoyed this episode, you can show some support by subscribing to the podcast, sharing it with your friends, and leaving a review.